behave properly on their own. To open the case for the proposition, we have Gideon Benayan, who is a media lawyer and partner at Shillings, specialising in reputation and protection for high profile individuals, including Naomi Campbell. Um, recently, he won a major privacy case, establishing a law protecting children from intrusive paparazzi. So, Gideon, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Madam Chairman, the motion before the House this evening is that it believes that the press cannot be trusted to behave properly on their own. From my experience as a solicitor dealing with reputational issues, I know the motion is undoubtedly correct and in a minute I'll provide three arguments in support of it. Firstly, that the media are motivated by commercial considerations. Secondly, that even if they are able to set those commercial considerations aside, no person can be a judge in their own court. And thirdly, by reference to the press's actual conduct. Before I do so, I must stress that a free press is one of the most fundamental aspects of any democracy. Most essentially, the press reports on and scrutinizes the activities of those in power and holds them to account. The press itself is immensely powerful in its own right, so I want to be extremely clear at the outset of this evening's debate that I am entirely in favour of the principle of a free press. Also, I should explain that when I talk about the press, I'm often only referring to elements of the British press. It would just be too loyally to repeat that phrase every time. We all know the British press enjoys enormous power, which it frequently wields admirably, urging readers to campaign for just causes. Less clear-cut in terms of uh, the press's influence, however, is their treatment of the McCanns, or take the example of the aftermath of Joanna Yates's death and the former school teacher, who the press hung, dried and quartered, essentially on the basis that he looked a bit odd. Those examples show why the press's power should be checked in order to protect members of the public. Protecting reputations from being falsely destroyed is essential for any democracy. Equally, people in the public eye need to know or need to be able to live their lives knowing that areas that relate solely to their private lives will remain private. Otherwise, think how many people, potentially brilliant people, some of whom may be in the room this evening, will be deterred from public office if the price for occupying public position is that every single aspect of your personal life and that of your families and friends will be offered up for public scrutiny. So I don't think that anyone can sensibly argue that the press should have no restrictions on them whatsoever. The question then is, can the press be trusted to enforce those restrictions themselves, or do we need external factors such as libel and privacy laws? I believe that we do, and I want to expand on three main reasons for this. Firstly, the media are motivated by commercial considerations. It's simply a liberal fantasy to think that the press is solely motivated by a desire to seek out the truth. Behind each newspaper is a commercial organization, often a mammoth one, looking to increase profits. However high their ideals might be, newspapers still have to resort to tricks to make money. This is even more so nowadays, as the media are facing commercial pressures, they're having to produce far more content in much less time and compete with many other sources of news information, many of which are free. Plus, income from advertisers has gone down, so the need to generate interest to maximize profits is greater than ever. The press are motivated to publish what sells. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but the motivation cannot be ignored when deciding whether the press should be totally free without any checks and balances to decide what should and shouldn't be published. Secondly, even if we ignore their commercial motivations, nobody is truly capable of acting as a judge in their own court. When it comes to the balancing act between the rights of reputation and the rights of free speech, the media will invariably make a biased decision. That's why we need a legal system in place which largely allows the media to publish information freely, but says they must accept the consequences if the information they published was untrue. The legal system also prevents the media from publishing private information if it's not in the public interest to do so in circumstances where if they did publish that information, it would be impossible to repair the harm done to the victim. Even publishers that are not driven by profits still have their own biases. Take WikiLeaks, for example. Its starting point is that no documents or information should be confidential. 
but it cannot be in the public interest for every piece of information about every subject matter to be freely available. For society to function properly, there have to be some things that remain private. And the hypocrisy behind such organisations is staggering. It seems it's one rule when WikiLeaks is publishing information, but when Assange himself is the subject of articles, he calls for the full protection of the law. So it's easy to denounce our laws until you yourself are the subject of an attack and realise just how damaging an unimpeded press can be. Thirdly, one only has to look at the history to know the press can't be trusted to behave responsibly on their own. Sadly, self-regulation via the Press Complaints Commission, the PCC, doesn't work. The PCC has no real power. As evidence, we only need to look at a handful of examples. Most obviously, there's the recent phone hacking uh, scandal. But the allegations we've been reading about recently are just the tip of the iceberg. In 2003, there was an investigation into the use of illegal methods by the press. It exposed a widespread black market for private information bought by newspapers from private investigators. And take the press-inspired so-called controversial topic of super injunctions. The only, reasons, or the re only reason injunctions had to develop superpowers is because the press were behaving so badly. Don't believe the misinformation. Matters of a truly serious public interest are not being prohibited from publication by our so-called and falsely labelled draconian laws. You are at worst being prevented from hearing about sexual scandal. In conclusion, the British press enjoys a huge, a huge amount of freedom and power. The press should yield its power responsibly, but it's not doing so. It has its own commercial motivations, it's incapable of being a judge in its own court, and history proves the press can't be trusted to act responsibly on its own. That's why robust laws to protect people's privacy and reputation are needed. I therefore urge you not to be taken in by the media lobby's scaremongering or by the powerful campaign of misinformation and to vote in favour of the motion. Thank you. we consider them to be either too intrusive or inappropriate to publish. A recent example. This week we were offered a set of photos of a pale-looking Cheryl Cole strolling in the grounds of her LA hotel wearing a baseball cap, dressing gown and no makeup. We declined them for two reasons. Firstly, they were taken on private property and hence could be considered an invasion of her privacy in a place where she had a reasonable, reasonable expectation of said privacy. Secondly, she looked tired and dejected, as the Sun helpfully pointed out when it ran the photos on Monday. They decided to publish them for the very reason we opted not to, because she looked unhappy. For the tabloid, it represented a story, Cheryl's X Factor anguish, as the headline so subtly stated. For Hello, it was a somewhat negative image, which in our view didn't necessarily move the story on, and certainly wasn't worth causing her upset over by publishing. We value our relationship with the beautiful Miss Cole far too much. Hello, which is often credited, for better or worse, with pioneering the celebrity market in the UK, has always prided itself on its relationship with celebrities, royalties and others in the public eye. It is one based on mutual trust and cooperation with content that is both accurate and balanced. And it's why celebrities... Um, in a moment, please. <laughs> and it's why celebrities continue to come to the magazine with their stories. There is no question that we can be trusted to behave properly on our own. As I hope is apparent, we take the issue of privacy extremely seriously. With regard to the use of paparazzi photographs, we judge each case on its merits. Were they taken on private property? Did the subject look distressed in any way? Were the images fuzzy, suggesting the use of long telephoto lenses? And were children involved? You could surmise from the Cheryl Cole example, though, that self-regulation of the press is a selective business, 
the Sun clearly thought it was worth the risk. But in fact, it shows that the system does work. The Press Complaints Commission has subsequently confirmed that they have received a complaint from Cheryl's lawyers about the photos, thus challenging the paper's decision to publish. The PCC actively engages with celebrities like the Girls Aloud singer so that complaints do get lodged and standards can be maintained. There's no doubt that the climate has changed considerably over the last few years and increasingly editors are being forced to think carefully before they publish. It is no longer the free-for-all it was at the height of the paparazzi mania surrounding Princess Diana. The PCC has got tougher, particularly in relation to journalist and photographer behaviour, and that has helped to define parameters and encourage dialogue and resolution without recourse to law. What should also be acknowledged is the wider media's general willingness to adhere to its own code of practice, especially in its dealings with the royal family. Princes William and Harry were able to enjoy their schooling without undue tabloid detention after an agreement was thrashed out between the palace and the PCC. And for the most part, Prince William has been able to enjoy his lengthy courtship with Kate Middleton away from prying media eyes. When at one point press attention threatened to spiral out of control after more than 50 paparazzi descended on Kate's London home on her 25th birthday four years ago, Clarence House responded by introducing a zero tolerance policy in cooperation with the PCC. With that warning ringing in their ears, the British media chose not to publish photos of Miss Middleton playing tennis on private courts in Cornwall over Christmas a couple of years ago. The German press, however, showed no such restraint and along with the agency and photographer, found themselves having to fork out substantial damages for harassment and breach of privacy. As Prince William's private secretary, Paddy Harvison, said recently, all that is being asked for is that the newspapers abide by their own self-regulatory code and that photographers abide by the law and do not pursue and harass people. It needs to be a two-way street. The more the royals and their aides make themselves available, the more the press is willing to cooperate and seek guidance. It's certainly our approach at Hello. When the future Princess Catherine was snapped outside the Barclay Hotel after lunch with the Duchess of Cornwall recently, we checked first with Clarence House that there were no objections to publication, that she hadn't been followed or harassed. In the same way, we ran past them a photo of Prince Harry and his on-off girlfriend Chelsea Davy leaving a London, London nightclub a couple of weeks ago. In both cases, we got the nod to publish. By contrast, we were offered pictures of Kate Middleton sitting by the window in a Fulham Road restaurant recently enjoying dinner with a group of, group of friends. You most probably won't be aware of these images simply because no publication ran them. We didn't bother asking for permission. We knew what the answer would be and wouldn't have considered publishing them anyway. Interestingly, in keeping with this new spirit of cooperation, even lawyers appear, some of them, to be adopting a more helpful PR-style approach, showing themselves willing to take calls from journalists in an effort to sort an issue out, whereas in the past they most probably would have cringed at the thought. It's clear the media can't afford to get it wrong anymore, not least because of the de facto privacy laws that have been established through high-profile test cases, leading to substantial claims and payouts against the parties involved. The cost of defending a libel action has the so-called chilling effect of putting journalists off reporting an issue, effectively acting as a kind of censorship available through money and power, which is not in the interests of a free press. And why it is increasingly vital that the PCC continues to act as an effective and fair mediator. It's not just celebrities who benefit. The vast majority of the Commission's work is with members of the public. It circulates around 100 desist requests every year to protect the privacy of people who ask for its help, an example of collaborative work across the industry rather than any form of restraining order. On that point. Uh, and what happens exactly if a publication decides to ignore the PCC? What can the PCC actually make it do? Well, as how, how much money could it As I'm arguing, the, 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 um, the, the editors and the papers don't ignore the PCC. It's that there is a spirit of cooperation that exists. Um, crucially, cases are dealt with speedily, with complaints to the media usually resolved within a month, compared with the average length of a libel action of over 12 months. Given that prevention or rapid correction is the most important aspect of any press complaint, this is a significant benefit over old-style litigation. You could argue that the recent phone hacking scandal involving the news of the world proves that self-regulation doesn't work, but I would say that this is a prime example of the media acting as, it, as its own most vigilant watchdog. It was the Guardian newspaper that blew the scandal wide open when it revealed in January that the practice of electronic intelligence and eavesdropping was part of a far wider scheme than originally revealed. Of course, this involved criminal activity and is rightly being dealt with through the courts in the same way certain politicians have been involved in the parliamentary expenses scandal have been handled. 
But a few rogue operators don't justify penalising the industry as a whole. Rather, it is important to learn lessons from what has occurred. And to that end, the PCC has set up an expert panel to review material arising from the ongoing phone hacking accusations, ac actions. It's the voluntary buy-in from the industry that gives the PCC its strength. This means that the system can adapt quickly to change, address any problems speedily and reduce costs to all involved. It also means more people are happy with the outcome, thus proving the press can be trusted to behave properly on their own. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I should just say I've been uh, told a, a number of times this evening already that I'm here to be the funny one. Um, in spite of the enormously generous hospitality we've had this evening, I'm not sure I'm drunk enough to be the funny one. So um, I'm going to go for slightly interesting instead. Um, I hope that sways you. Um, I can only really talk from uh, personal experience in some ways. When I first uh, entered the public eye, I wasn't quite prepared for the press, the British free press, in all its uh, glory. Um, I just had a, a couple of early experiences, though, that was, were formative. For example, when my first series went out on ITV, I had a review in The Guardian that said, the spoof songs are fantastic, but the Kate Winslet impression is absolutely dire. My second series went out a year later, and the same reviewer in The Guardian said, the spoof songs are as bad as ever, but thank God for the brilliant Kate Winslet impression, which is back. So uh, <laughs> that was my first, uh, one of my early experiences of uh, dealing with the press. Uh, another one was when I gave a lengthy interview to The Sun, where we spoke on the phone for an hour with a very friendly journalist who uh, was very nice to me, and we, I thought we got on very well. We had quite a lot in common, and we had a nice chat, and it was a general interview that went on for a long time about my life and things I thought, and I made a joke about halfway through where I said, uh, she asked me about Lily Allen and whether I'd ever met Lily Allen. And I said, as a joke, because I spoof her in my show, oh, I once hid in the toilet from Lily Allen. I was so scared that she would punch me. Uh, we both had a good laugh, and the journalist knew that that was a joke. She knew that that had never happened. Um, the next day in the sun, <laughs> yes, you were looking at me going, you're so naive. Um, <laughs> the next day, the headline in the sun was, coward comedian Katie hides from Lily in the loo. <laughs> And the entire article was simply about the fact that I had hidden in the toilet from Lily Allen, which I knew wasn't true, the journalist knew wasn't true, and the rest of the interview that I'd done with her just apparently didn't exist. And that was the headline. And that headline has followed me around for the last four years, to the extent that when I was introduced on a recent episode of Have I Got News For You, I was even introduced as someone who had hidden in the loo from Lily Allen. So I learned quite early on that there were certain things that I was just going to have to live with from parts of the British press, that uh, I wasn't going to start getting het up about negative reviews, about thousand word character assassinations, even about hour long interviews that seem to have just dropped, you know, from uh, out of existence for the sake of one headline. I thought the way I'm going to deal with this is I'm going to at least expect one minimum thing from the British press and I'm going to ask them to be accurate. That's it. I don't particularly mind if they invade my privacy from time to time. I don't mind if they make me look like an idiot. I don't mind if they're so critical that it makes members of my family cry. I just want them to be accurate. Well, it seemed like that was too much to ask because I was invited to an award ceremony called the Shafters. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Shafters. Funnily enough, it's never actually reported in the press because it is basically a big tabloid piss-up, which happens once a year where all the tabloid and tabloid-esque journalists get together, they hire them, and they give each other awards, basically based on the level of nonsense that they have managed to get away with for the previous year. I'm not joking, I've been twice now. It's a lot of fun, and everyone does get very drunk. But they give each other awards, basically... Uh, 
to reward you if you've managed to get away with a load of nonsense. They have a, the, the main award, for example, is the Princess Margaret Award, which is named after a story that came out in the press in the 80s where two journalists had invented the idea that Princess Margaret was going to appear in the soap opera Crossroads. Um, <laughs> Now, this never happened. Crossroads finished shortly later, as did Princess Margaret. But um, uh, they've named an award after her for the most preposterous story of the year. And the whole atmosphere is basically a load of backslapping about what have we managed to get away with and not got in trouble with, not been uh, leg you know, legally brought to account or even fined for. Sometimes there's even an award for most groveling apology, uh, where every single aspect of a story that a journalist has put in the press is, um, is retracted the following week, even to the point where someone had to retract uh, a statement that um, a, a, an erroneous report of, a, of an actress called Samantha Morton who they said had had an affair with a co-star and uh, a hotel, and she had complained about uh, the lack of mustard in the hotel. None of this was true. It was later found. She, hadn't, she didn't even know the guy that they said she'd had an affair with, and even the hotel demanded a retraction, saying that they had never knowingly run out of mustard. <laughs> So that's the kind of thing that goes on at the Shafters. They've, they've, uh, they've decided to go on Twitter. Here's a few things. If you went on to the Shafters Twitter feed, they might, uh, you might find. The other day they tweeted, Guardian, Mirror and Independent all ran obituaries of Norman Wisdom saying he co-wrote Whitecliffs of Dover. This was found to be a Wikipedia hoax. <laughs> Latest on Abby Clancy, Peter Crouch. Mirror says she's taking him back. Star says she's happy on her own. And so it goes on. The Shafter says, Evening Standard says, Downton Abbey actress Penelope Wilton is the widow of Ian Holm, but he's not even dead. <laughs> So I, so I began to find that um, my basic minimum requirement from the press, that they could at least be accurate, was probably a little bit naive. And uh, if you want a more official um, evidence for that, you just go onto the PCC website, which was mentioned. Um, now, the problem with the PCC website is that, that they only deal with things once they've already happened. So what tends to happen is uh, a journalist will write whatever they like, then a complaint is made to the PCC, and then the paper issues an apology that's about a tenth the size of the original story, and everyone says no more about it. You can just have a browse on the PCC website. For example, recently, Anton Deck won an accuracy uh, claim with the Daily Star. Under the headline, headline deck to poppy the question. This is an example of when a tabloid um, journalist uh, comes up with a story to match a headline that they've invented that they quite like. So they wanted a headline deck to poppy the question, so that meant they had to find someone called Poppy that deck might be going out with. Uh, they did. They found a singer called Poppy Middleditch and said he was ready to propose. They also added a nice bit of detail about how Ant and Deck were holding business meetings in strip clubs. Now, this was all a bit of a surprise to Ant, Deck and Poppy. Um, and uh, the Daily Star had to say that we accept later that none of this is the case. None of this is the case. So the Daily Star had just basically invented a story. If you think that's confined to pop light entertainment stars, you can have another look further down the PCC page. Lord Mandelson in the Times, again an accuracy issue. The Times implied he was connected to an investment in, in Montenegro, which he discussed at a party hosted by, the, uh, by Nathaniel Rothschild in Davos. Later on, they had to concede that he was not president of the party, at the party, that no discussions had taken place, and that Peter Mandelson was not interested in any investments in Montenegro. It goes on. If you feel like that's all a bit lofty, here's something that might be a bit more relevant to you. Further down on the PCC page, a Mr. Charles Markland, an Oxford student, raised an accuracy claim with the Daily Telegraph, where he pr they printed a story saying that he had cheated in University Challenge after moving to a different college midway through the competition and not informing Granada TV. Mr. Charles Markland uh, made a complaint to the PCC. They said, following editing errors, we accept that none of this was the case. He did not cheat. He did inform Granada TV, and we're very sorry for the distress we may have caused. So, there we have it. We have the Shafters, just a big piss up, basically, where everyone enjoys themselves and laughs about all the stories they've invented. We have the PCC, which basically sort of puts a plaster on a broken leg after the event, when the damage has already been done. And so what about the journalists themselves? Well, Richard Pepiat has recently resigned as a reporter on the Daily Star. He wrote a letter, which he leaked to The Guardian, uh, his resignation letter to um, the eminent Richard Desmond. Um, in which he uh, referred to some of the reasons why he felt he had to resign. 
he said he had had to write a story recently in the press, in the Daily Star, uh, about some taxpayer-funded Muslim-only loos. Here is a quote from Richard Pepiat's uh, resignation letter. This would be a newsworthy tale were said toilets Muslim only, or taxpayer funded. <laughs> <laughs> Undeterred by the nuisance of truth, we omitted facts, plucked a couple of quotes, and suddenly anyone would think that a Rochdale shopping centre had hired Osama bin Laden to stand by the taps and hand out paper towels. <laughs> He said time and again he was told, if you won't write it, we'll get someone who will. And he even decided, after seeing an interview with Kelly Brook, the model and presenter, in which she had said in the interview that she had Googled herself re recently and seen a hilarious story that she had been visiting a hypnotherapist to help cut the time it took her to get ready for an evening out. She said, where do they get it from? Pepiat knows. He says, maybe I should answer that one. I made it up. Not my choice, I was told to. At 6pm on deadline day, staring at a blank page, I simply plucked it from my arse. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I would urge you to vote in favour of this motion because I think we have a press who demonstrably are not able to regulate themselves. All we ask is accuracy. Forget the rest, just accuracy. And yet even the minimum regulation that we do have for the press means that they can't even abide by that. So please, ladies and gentlemen, for my sake, <laughs> please vote in favour of the motion. Thank you very much. For Katie's sake, you may want to um, vote, vote to, uh, on her side. Uh, I would say for your own sake, you should oppose this motion. Because I think uh, from Mary Whitehouse's war on smut to the Guardian's campaign against tabloid phone hacking, one thing every anti-media campaigner has in common is that they think they know better than us. They think they have some God-given right to tell the media what to print, and by extension, to tell the rest of us what we have the right to read. And I would put it to them, who on earth do they think they are? Who gave them the special powers to decide what is fit for me and you to read or watch or listen to? And that's why I want to argue against any external control of the media tonight. Not because I hold a candle for Rupert Murdoch or the BBC or any other big media giant, but because I'm implacably opposed to the idea that unelected, busybody, nosy know-it-alls have the right to tell the masses what they ought to be reading. When you hear people say the press can't be trusted to behave properly on their own, almost always nowadays the implications of this is that external authority needs to be brought in to regulate the behaviour of journalists. And this regulation can either be imposed directly by the state, Ofcom or through the courts, or by a pseudo-state body like the Press Complaints Commission. And unlike some of my fellow colleagues who are going to oppose the motion, uh, I'm equally uncomfortable with self-regulating industry bodies that, in order to preserve their industry's independence from the state, imitate the role of a state body and take it upon themselves to censure journalists, even if they are quite toothless and are quite slow to actually censor themselves. And there are three key reasons why I'm making this argument, why I oppose the idea of any external uh, authority regulating the behaviour of the press and to decide on its behalf what is proper. Firstly, it impinges on the freedom of speech of journalists. Secondly, it has a detrimental impact on the way in which stories are investigated. And thirdly, it shows contempt for the court of public opinion. It shows contempt for all of us in this room. And I'm going to elaborate on these now. The first point on freedom of speech is ultimately that to suggest journalists can't be trusted to behave properly without the threat of external intervention, it suggests there should be limits to freedom of speech. So that there are certain things that journalists shouldn't be allowed to say, and consequently, certain things that we, the public, shouldn't be allowed to hear. 
Free speech is the ability to argue, to probe, to question, to criticise. This is fundamental to a democratic society. It's only through critical, open debate that issues can be properly raised and resolved. Free speech enables people to play a full and active role in politics and public life. Our attitude to free speech is also an important indicator of how we see ourselves and each other. A society based on the idea of robust individuals who value their liberty and wish to play a role in public debates will recognise the importance of free speech. However, today's society is increasingly based on the idea that we're emotionally fragile individuals. We need to be wrapped up in cotton wool and in need of protection from words and images. Giving more power to regulatory bodies by saying the tr press can't be trusted to behave properly by itself encourages the sense of both the vulnerability of individuals, but also that we're too stupid to make up our own minds. It places discussion and decision making in the hands of the authorities. And it's a dangerous state of affairs when journalists start to spend so much time in editorial meetings, as I've experienced, discussing what legally can be published, that it can actually overshadow a discussion about what is actually the best content to publish. Regulation affects a journalist's mindset. When you have to consider whether or not you will be censored, censured, or face legal action, it can be a serious obstacle that gets in the way of single-mindedly getting to the heart of an issue. And this can have a seriously detrimental impact on freedom of speech. Now, I suspect everybody in this room, including the proposition, would say they're in favour of free speech. However, too, too often what follows such a claim is a but. So, for example, people will say, I'm all for free speech, but not for racists. In the case of Jan Noir's Daily Mail article following the death of Boyd's own singer Stephen Gately, those criticising her were in favour of free speech, of course, but they thought her apparent homophobia was beyond the pale. As soon as something is deemed beyond the pale, as soon as there is a but, a but is uttered, uh, then you're no longer advocating free speech. And that's why I would always defend the right to be offensive. Not because, as a journalist, I get off on offending people, although obviously some people do, uh, but because unless, everybody, uh, unless if everybody has the right to speak their mind freely, without fear of being disciplined by authorities for being offensive, then there's no free speech. And obviously the argument for proper behaviour goes beyond just what is said by journalists. A key concern for many are the methods that a journalist uses to investigate a story. And the ongoing discussion about the phone tapping at the News of the World, which recently led to the resignation of Andrew, uh, Andy Colson from Tory Party HQ, is one of the most prominent examples of this. Now, investigative journalism is often a dirty business, and of necessity can involve various sorts of trickery and deception. Investigative journalists often work on stories involving lying, secret filming, and posing as criminals. It is, after all, the job of investigative journalists to try and find out what others don't want them to know. But the decision to undertake such activities is not made on the basis of general disregard for the law or the belief that journalists should be above it, instead on whether or not the story is a good one. If journalists break the law, then of course they should expect to face the consequences. I'm no anarchist, but it's worth keeping in mind that laws reflect what the society of the day believes is the best way to resolve some issues. That doesn't mean that all laws or system of lawmaking are good in themselves. And even the law recognises that journalism has a special role in society. Judges will consider the public interest defence. Now this doesn't mean they always win in court, it's simply a recognition of the democratic function played by dedicated professionals whose job it is to provide the public with information. Now, whether these methods are morally justified or not depends on whether they serve the public interests. So the police rightly declined to investigate the leaking of MPs' expenses by the Daily Telegraph, since this has clearly served the public interest. But it's often hard to know until afterwards what kind of story you've got. Now, I deeply dislike some of the investigations that have gone on in the media. For example, the invasion of privacy in the reporting of Max Mosley's apparent penchant for Nazi-themed sex sessions. Uh, but what he does, in, uh, what, in my view, what he does in his private life should be his business, not ours. And the contemporary media obsession with celebrities, like Kate Brandt, and uh, especially footballers, tends to distort this debate. But what we choose to condemn, and why, should be a matter for public discussion it shouldn't be reducible to an argument made in court and decided by a judge, by a small body of unelected individuals. Allowing anyone to place limits on free, uh, on free speech on our behalf denies us all the chance to decide what we should read about. Why should anybody decide for the public what counts as investigative journalism in the public interest and what is just salacious gossip? 
Judges, lawyers and regulatory bodies should not decide what is and what is not in the public interest. They should not be deciding what the press ought to report and what it ought not to report. Ultimately, it should be we, the public, who will decide what's in our interests. And those calling for media regulation, I'm almost out of time, uh, almost always assume that people, especially tabloid re readers or Daily Mail readers, it's never themselves, are too thick to make up their own minds. They adopt the completely false assumption that is often made, uh, that they're kind of devoid of free will and intellect, that we're so vulnerable that we need to be shielded from words. But we're not so vulnerable, and we're not so stupid that we just swallow everything we hear, we just act upon things on impulse. Journalism plays a fundamentally important role in democracy, to mediate information between the reporter and the public. Allowing judges or officials to decide what we can or cannot read or write undermines this role. By censoring the media, by having an authority decide what is proper or not, the public are taken out of public debates. I'm with the philosopher Karl Marx, who argued that a bad free press is always better than a good controlled press. Freedom of the media, with all its faults, provides the best chance we have at getting at the truth. Although we should never shy from criticising what the media produces, this should always be done in the informal public sphere, not through regulation. We should trust the media to behave properly, ladies and gentlemen, because the alternative is always far worse. And that's why I urge you to oppose this motion. Thank you very much.
Andrew Simmons, Trinity College. We've Obviously we have libel laws and they're designed to protect people from false accusations made by the press. But when these laws are used, for example, in the Simon Singh case, by the chiropractors stopping him from criticising claims they were making, unproven claims about the efficacy of their treatment, can't we say that the libel laws have failed to do what they're designed to do? Thank you, Madam President, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you mentioned, I am a former president of the union. It is very nice uh, to be back here, though it's rather daunting to think that it's actually seven years since I was president here. That's almost enough time to have read the union constitution in full, but I'm <laughs> not quite there. And I'm delighted to be here tonight with such interesting people on, on both sides of the debate. Obviously, we've heard, first of all, from uh, Gideon Benahim, who uh, is a partner from uh, the law firm Schillings. Now, I can let you into a secret tonight, which was that I wanted to speak first, and Gideon wanted to speak first, so you know, we both told Lauren this, and then uh, re the request came through, through from Schilling, saying, will you move? And I did what all good people do when you get a request through from Schilling, which is I gave it immediately. Uh, but fortunately, I didn't have to pay £50,000 in costs and so on. Uh, anyway, I would like to tell you a bit more about Gideon, but he took out an injunction to protect his privacy a bit earlier this evening, so, that, so that's it. Um, I'm also joined by Katie Brand on my side, who we've heard already, and uh, I saw yesterday on Twitter that she prepared for tonight, tonight, she wanted some inspiration, so she was able to call on Lily Allen and ask her what she should talk about. I mean, it, it's funny how similar our lives are, really, but anyway, <laughs> there you go. On the other side, we, uh, we've heard from Juliet Hurd, uh, who's the international editor of Hello, and it might shock some of you, but I, I didn't actually buy Hello Magazine this week. I mean, it was an oversight. I was busy and, you know, these things happen. <laughs> Thank you. What I, what I did, though, I did go online to your website because I thought I should, should, should check out what, what was going on. And uh, the, the main story headline there was that Zara Phillips and Mike Tyndall had set the date for their, quote, private wedding, or at least until you get involved, anyway. Uh, <laughs> Then, then came Patrick Hayes, who uh, writes for uh, Spikes, and he was previously in charge of sort of the relaunch of the Times Higher Education Supplement, although given the, the tuition fees rise, there's going to be another relaunch, and it's going to be called the Sunday Times Rich List from now on. <laughs> and finally we have Guy Black, or to give, to give you your proper title, you are Baron Black of Brentwood uh, in Essex, and I, I myself, I, I, I grew up in Buckhurst Hill, also in Essex, so between the two of us, we have covered the two main lo locations from the only way is Essex. So it's... Uh, it, you know, it's quite, quite a privilege to be with you. And I, I did ask Guy if we could uh, compare tips on vajazzling over dinner, but he wasn't interested, and I, I, I don't know why. But I, I did also note that you were Michael Howard's press secretary, and so fortunately, as you're on the opposite side to me, you are, of course, uh, well used to losing. So hopefully that will stand you a good stead for tonight. <laughs> but anyway... Enough of the bit that I could pre-write. Uh, tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we, the, the House has asked whether the, the press can be trusted uh, to behave themselves properly. And what I'm going to be saying tonight is that there is a difference between the tyranny of the press, which is what we currently have, and between the freedom of the press, which is something that we do want to protect. But in order to protect the freedom of the press, it doesn't mean we should allow them to have this tyranny. And I'm going to be looking at the way in which newspapers and magazines are structured and arguing that that demonstrates that the press simply cannot uh, be trusted to behave themselves. And I'm going to be looking at some exact examples uh, to, to demonstrate that point. The thing, ladies and gentlemen, is that Newspapers are commercial organisations. They're being run for profit. And despite this, despite the fact they're private firms, the worst that the Press Complaints Commission can do to them is, is to make them run an apology. They can't even impose a fine. Compare the sanction for newspapers and magazines, almost non-existent, to that that can be put on someone by Ofcom, which can find literally millions of pounds if broadcasters step out of line. And that is what I, I would suggest is a real deterrent, not, uh, not just uh, having to print an apology. 
And for me, it all comes down to readers. Because readers lead to advertising, and advertising leads to profit. And what that means is that newspapers and magazines tend to chase readers. They tend to chase them with all, all the restraint of Silvio Berlusconi at a bunga bunga party. <laughs> And it, it took me back to a, a clip from uh, Yes Prime Minister, one of my favourite programmes, where Jim Hacker says, I know exactly who reads the papers. He says, the Daily Mirror is read by people who think they run the country. The Guardian is read by people who think they ought to run the country. The Times is read by people who actually do run the country. The Daily Mail is read by the wives of the people who run the country. The Financial Times is read by the people who own the country. The Morning Star is read by people who think the country ought to be run by another country. And the Daily Telegraph is read by people who think it is. And as for some readers, they don't care who runs the country as long as she's got big tits. But there is a serious point here. Because readers are at the crux of this debate. Because, as Gideon correctly pointed out, there's increasing pressure on newspapers uh, to keep their readership, readership up. It is difficult. But ultimately, how do people like Richard Desmond or Rupert Murdoch or the Barclay Brothers make their money? They make their money by people buying papers. They make their money by advertising, going in those papers to those people who buy it. And yet, despite all of this, despite the fact that there's such plain self-interest in papers ch chasing ratings, there's so little currently to stop them from doing so. And the current system might be fine if new newspapers really did behave themselves and magazines really did behave themselves. But that simply isn't the case. And I'm not suggesting that it's every day or that every, or that every journalist. Far from it. The majority, you know, I, mean, I write myself, the majority do their best. But it's not always the case. Let's look, uh, Juliet, at your magazine, for example. Let's look at Catherine Zeta-Jones's wedding, when OK Magazine paid for the rights. And in breach of that, Hello Magazine went ahead and got some photos off a completely disreputable source. Where did Hello get their photos from? Off a guy who pretended to be a waiter or a guest at a private wedding. But Hello thought it appropriate to go and get those photos and publish them as a spoiler. Why did they do that? Was it in the public interest? Well. I find it hard to find any interest in Catherine Zeta-Jones's wedding, but let's assume there is anyway. OK Magazine was going to publish them anyway. It wasn't in the public interest for Hello to, to publish them, was it? No, you did it out of commercial gain, because your rival magazine was going to print them, and that's why you printed them instead. And that's why the House of Lords found in favour of OK uh, when they and the Douglases went through a very, very long legal battle that made people like getting very rich. But there are plenty of worse examples. Madeleine McCann has been mentioned already. And, of course, the, the, the Joe Yates murder. And uh, the, um, if you have an unfortunate hairstyle and happen to rent a flat to someone who's been murdered, then, of course, you're, you're in trouble there. By the grace of God, go, go the rest of us. And, of course, the, the phone hacking scandal but puts this very clearly. But the interesting po point that I found from work, working on reporting on the, on the phone hacking scandal is not just about that, but it's everything else that went with it. What about the practices of going through bins to try and find people's records? Is that reputable journalism? What about paying the police for information about number plates and, and other things like that? Is that responsible journalism? And, and I think the mistake you made, Pedro, was, was to confuse um, undercover reporting and irresponsible journalism, because I've, I've been involved in investigative reporting. And yeah, of course that should take place. Of course, in the right circumstances, you should go undercover, you should bug people, you should do all those things. But does that mean that when the story doesn't deserve it, that when you're merely chasing ratings, that you should be allowed to do it? And that's where the problem is. Because Richard Desmond and Rupert Murdoch do not necessarily draw that distinction. What are they primarily interested in? It's the bottom line. It's how many copies their newspapers will sell. And what sells is, is, is a really interesting or sensationalist story. It doesn't matter if it's true. Yeah. yeah. How do you think the BBC uh, isn't driven by the profit motive, nor is the Guardian driven by trust? Do you include them uh, in this kind of, uh, as a media in the same kind of way? Well, the BBC, for example, is regulated by Ofcom. So if the BBC steps up, line, I think the BBC is a great example. I mean, let's talk about it. Let's look at the BBC editorial standards, which work in a completely different way to newspapers. BBC editors, and this is why I think the appointment of Craig Oliver is quite bizarre in a way, BBC editors do not have that much leeway 
it t over, over the news agenda. What does the editor of Newsnight do on a day-to-day -day basis? They don't work out about the line that they can take in terms of an agenda. All they can do is decide which stories are the most important and, and which stories are less important. So what goes first on Newsnight, what isn't covered? But it's not the same as the editor of The Sun or The Telegraph or whatever other newspaper. Or include, uh, you know, I would include The Guardian in this because The Guardian still needs sales in order to, to survive. What, what, what's their prime motivation? It's about selling papers. And they, aren't, they don't have Ofcom there. They don't have Ofcom making sure they are fair. And they can be as biased as they like. And the papers are as biased as they like. And in some cases, that's appropriate. But it's when they step over that line. Yeah? Well, I, I, I mean, it's, per, it's perfectly reasonable for newspapers to take, a, to take an opinion. I don't, I don't have an issue with that. I don't think that any of us is saying that they shouldn't take an opinion. What I'm talking about is things like phone hacking, things like the McCann's, things like the Joe, Joe Yates case, all of which are situations where, the, where newspapers step over the line. Because accuracy does not come first. Let me, get, let me give you another example, which I, which I found, which I think is a great example. After Raoul Moat went on the rampage, um, the... Um, the Daily Star published a story, and Rockstar Games is a company that bring the, uh, that's in charge of Grand Theft Auto, the video game. And the Daily Star wrote a story saying that Rockstar were going to bring out a new game, thanks to Raoul Moat, called Grand Theft Auto Rothbury. Now, I don't know whether that seems to make sense to many of you, but it, it didn't strike me as right. But anyway, the Daily Star did have to publish an apology. Surprise, surprise. What did they say? Um, they, say, they say, we also published what we claimed would be the cover of this game, solicited comments from a family member impacted by the recent tragedy, and criticised Rockstar Games for their alleged plans. We made no attempt to check the accuracy of the story before publication, and did not contact Rockstar Games prior to publishing the story. We also did not question why a best-selling and critically acclaimed fictional game series would choose to base one of their most popular games on this horrifying real-life crime event. <laughs> quite a good point. That's what we see every that's what we see with, with the papers and it's because it's about sensationalism. Of course there are investigative journalists who do a great service to this country and we should not seek to curtail their freedom. But what we're saying in proposition is not that we should do away with the freedom of the press. We're actually trying to protect the integrity of the press. If we had re uh, real regulation, more similar to Ofcom, real powers to actually, to, for example, to find the press if, if they stepped out of line, that clears the path for real, proper investigative journalism. That's what I'm a fan of. I want something that will step in, and if someone complains, it will say, no, that is proper investigative journalism, or no, that is making up a story, that is something that is inaccurate, that didn't go through the proper checks. That's the distinction that I urge you to make tonight, that there is a difference between making up stories, between doing it for profit, nicking your rival's photos for profit, making up a story about Grand Theft Auto for profit, and between proper investigative journalism. And by curtailing one, it doesn't mean that we could tell the other. So I urge you to vote tonight, ladies and gentlemen, in favour of this motion and in favour of press freedom and against the tyranny of the press. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be back in the Union this evening to debate this profoundly dangerous motion. It's many years since I first spoke here, when I was unceremoniously ejected from the first round of the Freshers' debating competition in 1982. <laughs> My public speaking and political career nearly finished before it even began. I came through those doors thinking I was Demosthenes and left with my tail between my legs. And I just hope I can do a little better uh, this evening. Not least because this is a hugely important subject that encompasses the very fate of our democracy and the essential, inextinguishable role of a free press within it. Now, let me explain that, first of all, 
uh, I have not always been in the media or on the side of the media, but at times in my career on the other side of it. As you uh, heard, I did have the honour to be Michael Howard, who I gather was here last night, his press secretary when he was leader of the opposition. And during that time, I enjoyed what you might describe as a robust relationship with parts of the press. I have to tell you, it's not easy when you're doing a press briefing um, for somebody over the cornflakes in the morning to tell your boss that he's on the front page of the mirror, dressed as a vampire, <laughs> in an open coffin, with a stake through his heart. <laughs> at 8 a.m., think about it. Um, uh, so, there we are. Um, the press can sometimes be deeply irritating. Uh, you may sometimes hate it. I've hated it on occasion in the past, but it is vital that it's there and does its job as the watchdog of our freedoms. And just to pick up on a couple of points we've heard, yes, of course the press gets things wrong from time to time. We've heard about some of the complaints from the PCC website and the odd story from the Daily Star, which I don't take to be the sort of absolute apogee of British journalism. Um, but there are millions of stories produced in British newspapers during the course of the year, and if all we can come up with is a few bits about Ant and Deck, well, I think that says it all. Uh, and secondly, I make no apology for the fact that newspapers are businesses. If they're not businesses which try to sell their product, they don't exist. If the Daily Telegraph doesn't make a profit, or the Daily Mail doesn't make a profit, um, and the way to make a profit is to get people to buy your product, they're not there. We'd be left simply with The Guardian. I don't want to live in a country which is just run by The Guardian. <laughs> now, uh, let me take issue um, for a moment with this fanciful notion that the press is somehow left on its own. Newspapers and magazines don't just inhabit some form of bandit world where they get up to what they like. Life's not like that. First of all, the press is subject to the laws of the land just as you and I, and even the solicitors are. Um, and that means in particular, and even the BBC, uh, that means in particular that it abides by the laws of libel and defamation, of copyright, of breach of confidence, of contract, of contempt of court, and many others. It was once calculated uh, a number of years ago that there were over 140 specific pieces of legislation that newspapers had to take off note of when publishing a single item. And to that, you must now add a whole new raft of laws that were introduced by Tony Blair's and Gordon Brown's governments between 1997 and 2010. Yeah. Is the, is the existence of that law not evidence of the necessity to control the press and the fact that the press can't be trusted in absence of those laws? The point is that these are, these are the laws that bind us all, and the press um, respects those laws as well as its own rules, which I'm going to come on to in a moment. So we have now a whole new raft of laws. The Data Protection Act 1998 introduced into the UK law new and highly restrictive regulations covering a plethora of personal data. The Human Rights Act 1998, which enshrined into UK law the European Convention of Human Rights and which has brought us such a fundamentally undemocratic privacy law, which is of only use to the rich, and also introduced the age of the so-called super injunction, which is one of the most severe incursions into free speech that we have witnessed in peacetime. Then we have the so-called no-win-no-fee arrangements, um, which the European Court recently denounced as an unacceptable infringement of freedom of expression, but which still remain on our statute book. We have the Criminal Justice Act 2008, which allows for the jailing of journalists for simple breaches of data protection rules. And we have the so-called um, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, or REPA, a piece of anti-terrorist legislation which was used to jail Clive Goodman, the News of the World's royal reporter. And yes, there are laws on phone hacking too. Uh, so no, ladies and gentlemen, the press is not just free to get on with what it likes. It is subject to a whole range of restrictive laws far more draconian than anything else you will find in Europe. If this House votes for anything tonight, it should be to lift this onerous regime, not to add to it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is not even the end of the story. The press does even more than is required by all those laws through its own self-regulation, which we've heard a little about this evening. That might, means we abide by a code of practice drawn up by editors and we submit to the jurisdiction of an independent press complaints commission funded by the newspaper industry of a sign of our commitment to high ethical standards. And that co code contains a tough set of rules covering a whole range of journalistic activities, not just the obvious ones like privacy and accuracy that we've talked about, but also the protection of children, discrimination, the, pe uh, the protection of people suffering from grief and shock, victims of sexual assault and so on. And over the last 20 years, as we heard in the, in the uh, uh, opening 
opposition speech. That code has significantly raised standards of reporting and now provides the public with a vital degree of protection. The inevitable rose that phone hacking was a failure of self-regulation. Ladies and gentlemen, phone hacking is a failure of the law. Phone hacking is against the law of the land. If it was going on, it is the law that has failed, not the Press Complaints Commission. Have you not proven through that argument that press is not a law by the entity and is not trustable? There are millions of stories written by tens of thousands of journalists in papers every year. Are we saying that from time to time things don't go wrong? It would be a unique institution. The British press would be a unique institution if no error. I make errors of judgment in my life. I apologise for them and get on. I like to think that 99 percent things right. So no, I don't think that argument washes at all. Um, the PCC is a good system because it's based on the moral authority of the editor's code and it works. Uh, and what's more, it means that the heavy and hideous hand of the state plays no role on deciding on the content of newspapers. And that, Madam President, is at the real heart of this debate. No, be no doubt about it. Because if the press cannot be left on its own to look after itself, which it does at the moment, subject to the law and to the code, then who is to do it? And the answer is the state. Do we really want to live in a society where government controls how newspapers operate? In case you're in any doubt, I'll give you two countries that do. Zimbabwe and Egypt make very good case studies in statutory regulation. In those countries, there are statutory press controls and statutory regulators. I commend to you in particular the Supreme Press Council of Egypt as a model of this sort, which clamped down on the last vestiges of a free investigative press. And with that dies uh, democracy. For it's vital in a free society that there is a free press that can criticise, scrutinise, investigate, irritate, goad and expose those in positions of power and authority in our country. From Profumo back in 1963 to the scandal of MPs' expenses exposed by the Telegraph last year, that is what the press has always done. And the day the press ceases to do that, shackled by state controls, because they would be state controls, you have no democracy anymore because you have no informed choice. The corrupt get off the hook, the Robert Maxwells and the Jonathan Aikens and the Geoffrey Archers of this world, their crimes hidden by super injunctions and excessive state regulation. The hypocritical, um, who do one thing in public and another in private, go on laughing at all of us behind our backs. And criminals, so many of whom have been uh, exposed by a free press over the years, laugh all the way to the bank. I don't think it wants to live in a society like that, and I don't believe any of you do either. And let me just nail one other issue that we've heard a little of tonight. We've heard a bit about the Daily Star and the Sun and some of these sorts of things um, at one end of journalism, and a view that somehow you could produce a set of controls that just deals with them, that leaves lovely newspapers <coughs> like The Guardian and The Independent, The Independent something the observer free no press controls would bind every single newspaper what bound the son of the daily star to deal with those few inaccuracies that have happened uh, in the past would bind everything from the cambridge news to reader's digest um, i don't think that is right um, mr president uh, madam president i was last in cambridge a few weeks ago to um address the Peter House Politics Society, a great institution. And afterwards, the master very kindly handed me a copy of a Pelican book called Liberty in the Modern State, published in 1930 by Harold Lasky. Now, I'm not normally one to quote Fabians and Marxists, but on the way home, I found a, a paragraph in it with which I profoundly agreed. He said back in 1930, once we inhibit freedom of speech, we inhibit criticism of our social institutions. The only opinions of which account is then taken are the opinions which coincide with the will of those in authority. Historically, the road to tyranny has always lain through a denial of this realm. It is not a road I urge you to take this evening, ladies and gentlemen. Show your support for a free and responsible press that tells you what's going on in this country and for the individual liberty that it protects and which has so, always been so highly valued in this chamber. Ladies and gentlemen, throw this motion out.
um, through the door that you lead by. Eyes to the right, nose to the left, abstentions down the middle, and could you just give our speakers another round of applause for tonight?